today's message is Amen. that I'm going to be bringing today is what you may not know about Pentecost. Uh, many of us have used the word for a long time. We've uh, heard different opinions about Pentecost, but many people do not know what Pentecost, uh, Pentecost is. Uh, some denominations run off with the word, trying to establish it in a certain way to benefit them and uh, illuminate them ahead of everybody else. But there's some things I think you might want to have your pens and your papers ready for today. We're going to talk about the church in my continuation uh, study on how the organized church started and why. Uh, we're going to be talking out of Acts, the second chapter, verses one through four. This is the addressing Pentecost. Uh, and let's get prepared. Now, last week when you were with me, we talked about, um, actually it was uh, Tuesday because I used Tuesday as a way to give some different insight onto the following, the next Sunday message. So it kind of gives me a chance to get people ahead of the group when we talk about certain things. But last, last week we talked about the natural man, we talked about the spiritual man, and we talked about the prophetic man. Uh, I believe everybody still remembers what that was about because the natural man, when he's born, that's what he is natural. But when a man receives Christ, he's a spiritual man. And when we leave this place and go to heaven, as Christ calls us, during the day of the rapture, we become the prophetic man. However, that dual purpose also works in the church because the church is God's chosen people. Uh, then they are the Holy Ghost speaks through man, which is the church. And then the prophetic church is also, when you read in the Bible, where it says the church is removed out of, of the earth during the, uh, the rapture, it's talking about the church, which is ecclesia, the people. Uh, the one thing that so many people are always quoting, and this may catch some people by surprise, Pentecost does not mean the birth of the church. And I'm going to prove my point. But as a church, as an institution, you believe, remember the history we've already established that the God had chosen his uh, people 1500 years before Christ was even here upon the earth. That was the Jews coming out of the ch children of Israel. Uh, when I say Israel, you know, we're talking about the man Israel who once was Jacob, didn't turn, man became Israel. Israel had 12 uh, sons that was uh, uh, noted as the uh, tribe of Israel. Now, you know that Israel did have some daughters as well, but they were not counted in this number because of how historically women were not counted in the mark uh, when it came to numbering. It was always referring to the men's and the boys. That's why even at the time when Jesus fed the 5,000 with the, the fish and the loaves of bread, that there's a good chance that that number was higher than 5,000 because they did not count the women. It could have been close to around 10,000, which <laughs> makes the story even greater of what God has done for us. But we want to look at that, and I'm going to prove my point. If anything, it is the birthday of the Holy Ghost in the church when we talk about Pentecost. Uh, there's a reason I say that, because if you say it is the birthday of the Holy Ghost, that would mean there is a previous instance where the Holy Ghost would have already had the inception with the church. I'm going to show you that. Uh, everything being built around the Holy Ghost descending upon the disciples, that was a great event. That was undoubtedly something that we should never forget. We need to understand what the event actually meant. This was not the only event that has happened in that like manner. Acts 2, 3 uh, reads like this. And there appeared unto them, who is them? The disciples who were in the house for the time. Uh, and it is, as it appeared unto them, cloven tongues like as a fire. And is set upon each of them, each of the disciples that was in the house. And they were all filled with the, the what? Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. One of the big problems that we do have across different denominations is what that means speaking in tongues. Because if you read your Bibles, you also find, I believe as Paul said, it is better to speak one word with understanding in many words without understanding. And also that if someone speaks in tongues, there ought to be somebody there 
to yeah, interpret it for in understanding. And verse 5 says, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, but devout men out of every nation. Remember that, out of every nation under heaven. So it wasn't just a uh, a few people that was in the general vicinity or, or, or in the countryside, but there were people from every nation. Why was that? Because this was during the Passover feast when this happened. During the Passover feast, they all people, all Christians were all ordered to come to the Passover feast at least three times a year in order to come before God in Jerusalem in the temple. The temple was used as the place where God would meet his people. <gasps> Excuse me. Before Christ, we know that the only ones who actually could go before Christ was who? It was actually the Levite priests. And now it was mm -hmm. reduced to only them having access to speak directly to God. That's why when Christ died upon the cross, one of the main things that cut that division was said when it was mentioned that the veil of the temple was rent. That meant you did not have to just go through a Levite priest to go to talk to God. I don't know about you. I'm happy because I don't know none that I want to go to to talk to anyway. So mm -hmm. we must be joyful in knowing that God has given us every provision necessary to come before him and praise him and praise his name. Verse six is one thing that we're going to note here carefully because it says, now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. I want you to look at something else that I'm going to give you reference to for those of you that have your Bibles and want to follow me, go to Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse 18. Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse 18. And we're going to read that together. Bring up mine. Let me go and bring that up. I want to show you something because I want to prove some other issues that I have. Um, Testament, Genesis. No, Exodus, 20th chapter. Starting at verse 18. I'll read that here. Exodus 20, verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. Why am I interjecting this? Because the thunder and the lightnings and the Holy Spirit coming down is not an, uh, uh, a single event during this time in Acts. If you remember, when, when I spoke of this being the time of the Passover, the Passover is the represent of the time when God had told Israel to paint the blood of the lamb over the, uh, the doorpost so that when the death angel came in, it would over, uh, pass over that house not bringing death into that family. That was all geared toward uh, saving them during their time of bondage or slavery uh, uh, in Egypt. So what is my point? Well, the Passover, when you speak of it, the Passover encompasses the, the Feast of Weeks because this day of Pentecost and the word Pentecost is not the first time it was used or understood because Pentecost was also a time which they had symbol for this, but it was not associated with the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to show that. So when we talk about the Feast of Weeks, we must understand what is referring to. That's how they come up with Easter. That's how they come up here with the Passover celebration and all those times. And this was also during the time of the Passover when all these people from all over was coming around because that's also during the time Christ was crucified. Another important part about this is that this was taking place in Jerusalem up on Mount Sinai. Now, there are some people that very say that this was Mount Horde or Mount Sinai. Um, most... Um, uh, uh, professors and them that teaches this believe that this being in Jerusalem because there was a range of mountains all on the same mountain 
but as this being Mount Sinai, what was the reference to it? Because when they passed out, uh, left out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea and they came into this land before the mount where Moses went up into the mountain and spoke with God, this is when this event happened. Now, you, you also remember, and yet maybe you could help this to help put together why I do different topics. If you remember when I talked about translations of the Bible, what does it mean? Who's interpreting what it says? Well, in you just read Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse 18, but the Torah, which is also a translation of the original text, uh, but by written by the Jews, here's their interpretation of the same scripture in Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse 18. And all the people saw the voices. Now listen to that. Do you hear this? Uh, this says, and all the people saw the voices. Note that it does not say the voice, but the voices. Whereby Rabbi, I can't pronounce his name, said that God's voice, as it, it was uttered, split up into 70 voices in 70 languages so that all nations should understand. Now, it's the curiosity of this that was held with me is the who, what, when, where, how, and why is that the same text here in the Torah that we read in Exodus the 20th that was written by Moses, the interpretation of words is somewhat different. But I can see somewhat what it was saying because in 19 it says, they, and they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. They were afraid of God when they saw how God spoke to Moses up on Mount Sinai, the mm -hmm. thundering, the lightning, uh, uh, the flashing and all of that. Now, I did know that you hear, um, and all the people saw the thunders and the lightning and the noise of the trumpet. Here's where we got to pay attention. You know, and I study in Revelations when it spoke of the trumpet, it spoke of a voice like a trumpet. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when God speaks, we may not be able to understand the language sometimes or be able to identify or to describe the language and we can only speak in a manner which is what we're accustomed to seeing so when i read this the same experience that happened up on mount sinai during the time of the passover week this is the same balance between what i'm seeing up and what we call in acts 2 cloven tongue as they experienced in mount sinai 1500 years earlier I hope you can see what I'm saying there. The Feast of Pentecost, or they call it Shoat in Hebrew, was just starting in Jerusalem at the temple, also known as the Feast of Weeks. Listen to this. 50 days or seven weeks after the Passover. The Passovers after they came out from Egypt is when they marked these 50 days or seven weeks. This becomes the celebration for the event of the placing of blood on the doorposts, escaping slavery, crossing the Red Sea, and reaching Mount Sinai. 50 days or seven weeks. That's the celebration. And that is what is referred to as Pentecost in our term uh, of the word usage. So they were actually celebrating Pentecost during this time of the celebration in Acts 2. The temple is often referred to as the house. So when you read your Bible, when you hear the word and they say the house, you know that they're talking about the house that's in Jerusalem or in the temple place in Jerusalem. The house of the Last Supper and of the Great Commission is said to have belonged to the father and mother of St. Mark and Barnabas, uh, his uncle, Colossians, the fifth chapter, verse two. You write that down. You won't want to cross reference it. So that's just giving you a little bit more history of where we're talking about. Most authorities claim the disciples were assembled in the upper room in Jerusalem. So now when we speak in part, we talk about Jerusalem. We speak about the upper room. We speak about the house. And these are things that oftentimes when we read our word, 
we get confused and don't really know what they're talking about because they're using different words to identify the same location. So Acts 2, uh, 6 to 12, it states that a huge crowd from every nation to hear Peter speak. That's of, of great importance that we want to, to look at. So if you go to Acts, the second chapter, Acts, the second chapter, as I find it, Acts 2, 6. It says here, now when this was noised abroad, I, I want to back up just a little bit more, just, just a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to go all the way back to verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost, see, that's the day of the occasion that they were talking about. So Pentecost doesn't mean the birth of the church because Pentecost was already there. Pentecost was already the, the filling of God's chosen people before this time occurred in Acts 2. And, the, and when the day of Pentecost, that's in the Passover, was fully come, all the people were there. They were all with one accord in one place. Do you see the significant value of how God can work in a group of people in a setting when everybody's there with one purpose? They said on one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Let me back up. Why is it that we have so many church meetings? We even have opportunities where uh, we come together, different churches assemble together, uh, our organized churches, they're all in the same place. And why is it that when they're all in one place, uh, on one accord, why is it that we don't see the moving of the Holy Ghost that would satisfy and make joyful God uh, make a joyful heart of God to see that many people come together, all coming to praise him. Because verse 2 said, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, heaven as if a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Well, the answer to the question that I brought to you is because a lot of times when most people come to a fellowship together, and, and the various organized church surroundings, my experience had been they're not all on one accord. Why? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you got the church number one here. We got church number two here, church number three here. And what makes it even worse, they turn around and say, uh, let me see the people who are from my church. And they, they, they stand up. Then another person say, well, let me see the people from my church. This goes on because they all coming to represent themselves individually, not collectively on one accord. And I'm hoping that we can overcome that. Let's quit talking about uh, whose church it is. And we're coming together, we're coming together as a people of God to celebrate one God with one church that's gonna give us one place that we'll all be together in the millennium period and we'll all be one people in the new Jerusalem. But the separation of churches, denominations, and religion is all a plot from Satan to keep us divided because a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. Verse 3 says, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled. Oh, wait a minute now. I've read some places when we were talking about this being a place of, where the disciples were there, but I've read places where they said there was 150 of them present. I don't know where that number come from, but they're saying that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now look, this is not a special language doing this here, where it talks about filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, because this is an illustration of a God sending the Holy Ghost down to a people who could not speak the language of the people that were outside. And God wanted everybody on the outside. I believe it said here, the uh, every nation under, the, under heaven, how many that may have been, so that it, it, they had to have the language of each of those different nations be able to hear what God said in their tongue. So the, the cloven tongues that we're talking about here was not speaking 
in a heavenly voice where people didn't understand, everybody present heard what God said in their voice. Now, I don't know about you. I can imagine if I'm in another country and I'm trying to find something, trying to get somewhere, and nobody speaks the language that I speak. How overwhelming would I be if I heard a voice say, Al, go down to such and such a place and make a left turn, ask for so-and-so, whatever you might say, just to hear it in my own language would be thrilling to me. Well, this is what happened during this time because these people were shocked that they're hearing God speak in their native land. Why the emphasis on their native land? Because if they came at this time to hear Peter speak, then unless Peter, Peter spoke in all those different languages or they had an interpreter, they would not have understood what God was saying. But all these people came to Jerusalem for this purpose. So it made it easy for all of them to hear what Peter, what God had to say in their native tongue. That was fascinating. And then here it says, verse five, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together. So during this time it happened, and I guess other people started talking to others around in the area and everybody dropped what they're doing. That's the picture I'm seeing to come and see what was happening over here in Jerusalem. And they said the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own tongue. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, behold, are not all these which speak Galatians? So this, uh, <coughs> Galatians. So this is what surprised them. We will talk about miracle. When God wants to talk to you, he don't care where you are. He don't care who you are. He's one God for the entire world. He can speak to the Jews. He can speak Arabic. He can speak Japanese, Chinese. He can speak uh, Spanish. He can speak all the nations and make everybody understand what he has to say. Now, he obviously is uh, a God that able to uh, close the gap between pe person to person, country to country, because he can speak the same language. But we must be careful that we listen to folks who are not speaking the language of God. What am I trying to say? There are many people that claim that Pentecost was the day the church was born. No, the church wasn't born, but the church was uh, instituted as a church entity, as a uh, organization in that sense, where it physically existed because the church ecclesia had already started 15 years earlier. All through those years, God struggled with the church. And you got Old Testament and New Testament scriptures that tell you just how stiff-necked and how hard-hearted hard, hard his people were. We must be willing and able to always understand and hear the voice of God. Some people don't hear the voice of God because they are afraid of God, because they have seen God uh, in his action. But the Bible says, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, beginning of understanding. So we must know that God always will give us what we need to know, even at the time we may not understand it. We can't go anywhere that God is not walking with us. Verse 8 says, and now hear ye every man in your own tongue wherein we were born. So when we look at this, let's remember something. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, the conception of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the individual, we must know that it, we as a church, that the Holy Ghost is not something anymore or a person that is recognized in the Bible. Three entities, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Some people don't believe in that, but they don't believe the Bible then because if you read your Bible, you understand that all three of them are the same person. We can read that. So, but as Christians, we know that Jesus died, came from uh, God, and died for our sins because we couldn't be for the sins. 
that we have a right to the tree of life. Jesus himself also said that I got to go. I'll go because when I leave, I, I'll send a comforter unto you and he lead you into all truth. You know your Bibles. We've studied this, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. On the day of Pentecost, that day is when the natural man became a spiritual man in Christ Jesus, God our Father. So we are now indwelled with the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? Everywhere you go, we don't have to ask for the Spirit to come. The Spirit is with us. Now, some people who choose to live a life that's not pleasing to God can cause the Holy Ghost to withdraw from you. That's not safe at all because you lose your power. You can lose your life. You can lose uh, everything that you stood for because with the Holy Ghost, even let's go back further in the uh, Garden of Eden, who God made man, it said that God breathed into man nostrils and he became a living soul. The breath of God is recognized as the Holy Ghost. The spirit of God is recognized as the Holy Ghost. So when we read God's word and we see the word Holy Ghost, which is primarily in the King James Version, most other versions do not translate Holy Ghost. They say Holy Spirit. I like Holy Ghost. I like the translation of the Bible of uh, King James 16, 1611. So we must be encouraged and we must be empowered by the Holy Ghost to understand, understand God's word. Let's don't twist words up in order to gain favor amongst people. When we speak of Pentecost, we must know that it was not an event uh, that was during the time uh, that, let me back it up. The Holy Ghost is an event which man was filled with the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost did not derive from the coming of the Holy Ghost and touching the disciples. The, Holy, the Pentecost was the day of recognition known as the Feast of Weeks, would uh, uh, which was relevant and celebrated the Passover of the cross and the Red Sea. That whole seven weeks, that whole 50 days is what Pentecost represented. We must be careful and not go on. Now, I've been to church where uh, they say that the church was uh, the, the the start of the church was during the time of Pentecost. Uh, that's not the case. We've already proved that 1,500 years earlier. So we must follow what the word of God says. Let's not be confused. When we read our Bible, let's understand the terms. And actually Acts, first, verse 1, already explains what I'm saying. It said, and when the day of Pentecost was fully, fully come, that was the start of this event. And during that day of Pentecost is when the, the Holy Ghost came down up on the people that were in the upper room in Jerusalem. So as we study the church, we must know our history and know where we come from. But don't make let people think that if you don't belong to a, a specific religion, that you are not in the church of Christ. You are in the church of Christ called Ecclesia. And when we come together, and I'd like for us here at Redemption and Restoration, be the type of people that we see here in our, uh, our studies when it talks about they came together and they were all on one accord. Although we have different religious backgrounds, denominations present here with us today, it brings me great joy to see and feel God's very present in this because he's taken people of different uh, religious backgrounds and bringing them to one. And I have to say for y'all to walk with me and my wife and one another for one year, we must be on one accord. We might have differences in opinions, but we are all on one accord. Same mm -hmm. Christ. That's what makes me have such joy to be around you, to be a part of you, to look forward to seeing you on Sundays and Tuesdays, and to celebrate with you on your special occasion. Because when you allow me to come in on your special occasion, you bring in great joy into my soul and my heart 
and that is a that's pleasing to God. And he's also bringing a refresher to me and to one another because each of us have great joy in celebrating each other. God said that we are to love one another as Christ has loved us. So as we continue the studies on Tuesdays and on Sunday, we will study just what the church looks like, where the church came from, who is the church, and how did we get so divided in today's living. I'm mm. going to bring all of that to you. I am grateful. Thank you for your time, your your joy, your comments. And I, as usual, usual, I'm going to ask, does anybody have any questions, any statements they like to say? Because different than a sermon, you can't ask the preacher nothing. But on here, you can ask all the questions you want, and you got the floor to ask those questions yourself. You got the mic. 